This is the Bookwaves Artwaves Hour. Interviews with writers on KPFA's nationally syndicated Bookwaves program, along with interviews about film and theater and archive book interviews that stretch back four decades. I'm your host, Richard Walensky. Today's program begins with an interview recorded in 1991 with noir and detective writer Andrew Vax, who died on December 27, 2021, at the age of 79. That's followed by an interview with author Charles Yu, whose novel Interior Chinatown won the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction and is now available in trade paperback. But first, a quick note on Omicron again. Venues around the Bay Area continue to cancel and postpone events, often on a daily basis. If you plan on attending, please check the venue before you leave your home. You can find links to local bookstore calendars and theaters by going to the kpfa.org webpage for today's program. Now on to that first interview of the show. The 1980s and 90s presented an explosion of noir and detective fiction, led by such stalwarts as Elmore Leonard, Robert B. Parker, Sue Grafton, James Elroy, Sarah Paretsky. The list goes on. Among those first-rate practitioners was Andrew Vax. In his early novels, which all featured a protagonist named Burke, he established not merely a unique character with a unique background and unusual associates, but also a way to bring the public's attention to child abuse and particularly child sexual abuse. On June 27, 1991, Richard A. Lupoff and I had a chance to speak with Andrew Vax while he was on tour for his sixth novel, Sacrifice. I guess the place to start is with Burke. Who's Burke? Burke is the prototypical abused child with all the abused child's hypervigilance and distrust of systems and agencies and institutions. A man with a family of choice as opposed to the biological family he never had and not a private eye at all. In fact, almost the antithesis of the literary white knight. He's not a Chandler clone or a Parker imitation. He's a career criminal. What differentiates him from others of his breed is simply his over-identification with abused children and his reactions to that. You mentioned repeatedly in the books that Burke is a jailbird. Uh, Burke was first incarcerated as a youth the first time was for a shooting. After that, there were a series of thefts. After being released from prison, he did time for hijacking twice, uh, for attempted murder once, and for a variety of armed robberies. He has a long felony criminal history. And in fact, in Sacrifice, he's perfectly willing to palm off uh, phony bonds to make some money. Oh, now he's graduated to the point where he considers himself an evolved criminal. So yes, he traffics in bonds, he stings kitty pornographers, he lies, cheats, and steals as a way of earning his daily bread. Well, what makes him an interesting private eye, in quotes, is that he also does that kind of work undercover for... Uh, district attorney's office in sacrifice, certainly. Well, he's not really, again, it's a question of joining forces to achieve an objective. If you read it closely, while he purports to be working undercover for the DA's office, he's really trying to get his hands on this guy's money. So he's perfectly willing to set up a child molester in a sting and follow him and get him popped for the crime. But he also burglarizes the guy's apartment. Right. And... It's as though the district attorney understands that, hence the extra delay in executing the warrant. So it's more on a combination of forces than it is one working for the other. You also have a number of other very interesting characters, a silent man by the name of Max. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about Max? Max is silent. Max doesn't hear, Max doesn't speak, although Max communicates wonderfully well. Max is a Mongolian, not a Chinese, as most book reviewers report him, and he's a martial arts expert. He's fashioned his own way of survival in the world, just as Burke has, and they become close under combat conditions that neither of them initiated, and now they consider themselves brothers. You also have another character who doesn't appear in this, uh, Michelle. 
was a uh, transsexual, and yes. she appears in the other books. Yeah, well, she appears in Sacrifice as well, only Briefly not at the very beginning, just, yeah. just by communication through letter, yeah. So ever since the first book, she's been working out this issue of her sexuality and deciding on certain choices that she has to make, and that can't go on forever. You also have, in each of the books, um, central women who are very who are both powerful and mysterious mm -hmm. uh whether it be flood strega or in this latest one uh the da named wolf mm -hmm. women are stronger than we are not necessarily that they can bench press more but i've seen women and men perform under a lot of conditions you know i ran a maximum security prison i was a federal investigator i was a caseworker i was in biafra during the war seen lots and lots of conditions and it's women who distinguish themselves in my eyes with their strength and their tenacity some of the other members of his band of operatives the mole who mm -hmm. to me is a fascinating character the prof who's another fascinating character what about these guys are they well, based on any reality of course they're based on any reality uh you gotta understand something these books are intended to be a ground zero look so i write about stuff before the journalists do strega smoked crack in 1986 the prof was speaking in rap before there were any rap records. This stuff exists way before it's reported. But the average citizen, it doesn't become real to them until they see it in a newspaper. All of these people, their character and characteristics are based upon people I've known and interacted with either positively or negatively. Yeah, you mix and match and you commingle and you composite to protect, in, in this case, to some extent, the guilty. But sure, I think that the truth is in the perceptions, so that if a virgin writes a sex scene and you read it, you know something's tinny about that. You know it's not flying. And I think the reality of these characters depends on a person's life experience. The fact is that if these characters ring true to you, it's because you've had experiences with similar kinds of people. If they ring bizarre to you, you have not. That's it. That's the truth to it, bottom line. Are you familiar with any of the old pulp series, I mean, Doc Savage, The Shadow, and so forth? The Shadow through the radio. Mm -hmm. Not from reading it, but listening to it, yes. Uh, do you see any similarity between Burke and his band of associates and operatives and The Shadow and his band of agents? The Shadow was, uh, as near as I can remember, an extraordinarily well-educated, well-groomed, high-society member who did the right thing simply because it was the right thing to do and had a mission to fight evil. His girlfriend, Margo, was it? Margo Lane, was a, yes. Was another great beauty. He had was surrounded by wealth and luxury and riches and undertook to fight the forces of evil because of his purity of heart. Similarity with my guys? No. Mm -mm. So you, you refute the charges then quite clearly that the characters or the situations are in any way cartoonish and, in fact, quite the reverse. This is a very realistic look of New York from the perspective of a particular individual. Look, there is no reality other than a person's perception, right. period. Okay. What I'm only, I'm not interested in defending my vision of New York. I'm not interested in defending whether characters are real or false. What I'm interested in defending is anybody dumb enough left in the world to say that the events are imaginary, that kids are not right. molested, that kids are not abused, <clears throat> that incest doesn't take place. One of my favorite stories about that is when flood first came out i was sent to england on a tour and i sat there was a reporter there and he met me and he said you know my god how can you make up this stuff what kind of ugly evil fetid imagination do you have to make up this stuff and i tried to respond being a guest in a foreign country with some degree of uh, self-control but a few years later i returned to england with another book and on the front page of the paper that day and i remember the boy's name to this day it was a little kid named jason swift he was video sodomized to death by a gang of pedophiles who had all just been convicted of it. It was on the front page of the British newspaper. I had the fortune to meet the same reporter. And I tossed him the paper. I said, my God, how could you guys make this stuff up? And he just bowed his head. I have made up nothing when it comes to those events. And anybody whose head is in the sand can't refute that. You just The body counts support it. The sacrifice deals with what they're calling ritual child abuse. Mm -hmm. And you come up with a an interesting theory that all the satanic rituals that wind up popping up in the uh, stories are all set up by the people doing it. They're interested in the child porn. They're not interested in the Satanism. Right. And it's all, it's all a cover so that nobody would believe the children's stories. Look, when a priest molests a child, do you call it Catholic child abuse? 
No. No. I just call it child abuse. You, call, you just call it child abuse. So let me just deconstruct it for you very simply. What these guys are is predators. And terrorism is their weapon. So the first step is to terrorize the child. You, you kill a small animal in front of a child. You make the clear point, I have total power over life and death. You wear the masks. You do the chants. You have the pentagrams and the 666s. And all the rest of that, it does two things. One, it terrorizes the child. But two, if the child finds it within him or herself to disclose, the disclosures sound like insanity. They sound bizarre. And prosecutors get sucked into thinking they have to convict somebody of satanic abuse instead of straightforward sodomy or rape or kiddie pornography. Now, you know, there are Satanists, obviously. There are people who practice Satanism. I don't claim to be an expert on Satanism, although I've talked with a number of Satanists and read. I don't see anything in their rituals, anything in their commandments that says you have to rape children. So I don't think this is satanic child abuse. If child abuse was satanic, Christianity would be the cure. It just hasn't proven to be so. Is, is this all something fairly recent, or does this, does this go back a number of years? Terrorism goes back to the, probably the first three people that ever got together. Right, right, but I'm talking more specifically of the use of Satanism for child abuse. It has a much longer history than journalism would have us believe. Terror is terror. Trappings change. For example, kitty pornography. When I was a kid, if God forbid you wanted to be in such an ugly business, you needed a whole ring of Confederates. You needed processors and you needed developers, okay? You can buy a camcorder. Exactly. And do homegrown kiddie porn that easy. So technology, fax machines have changed it. Interactive kiddie porn software has changed it. So it is with Satanism. There's always been terrorists around. But as Satanism has sort of gotten popular with teenagers who are in no way connected to what's called ritualistic abuse, the trappings are more available. And that's all. It's just utilization of what's at hand. We have here serious themes about child abuse in all of your novels, and uh, from the literature we've received, you've worked in, in that field quite extensively. Uh, 27 under... straight years, I'd say so. Okay, yeah. Uh, what exactly do you do? Now or? Now and then. I'll try and give it to you briefly. I was a federal investigator for the public health service in sexually transmitted diseases. Nobody does that job without running across child sexual abuse. Nobody. And you see it in such graphic, clear ways. You see a baby's rectum dripping gonorrhea. That's the end of the fantasy crap. I was a caseworker in New York City, and I don't think anybody would disagree that that is the belly of the beast. And again, you see child abuse. I went to be offered during the war. You see literally national scope child abuse. You see a generation of children removed from the earth. I came back here. Did you want to ask me a question? About well, that? about Biafra. Mm -hmm. uh, was this done out of political motives? My going there or the homicides? No, no. These, these acts. Was this uh, the calculated? Act, well, the weapon of war, in addition to the planes and the bombs and the guns, was starvation. As you know, in any kind of Darwinistic way, those less able to fend with themselves are not going to survive. Clearly, if you use starvation as a weapon of war, it's going to be the children that go. Was it deliberately calculated by one side or the other? I couldn't say. It was such a foreseeable result that I can't think otherwise. And what were you doing in Biafra? Uh, what I was doing there was mostly trying to leave. But uh, my mission was that, do you remember the war? Sure, remember? sure, okay. sure. You know, billions of dollars were raised. Okay, because unlike Ethiopia, they weren't just starving, they were being exterminated by various weapons. A group of foundations who raised a lot of money and who had UN consultant status wanted someone to penetrate the war zone. Because if you remember, the Red Cross plane had been shot down, there was no way in. Yes. You had to find your own, penetrate the war zone, and simply tell them, was the money that they were sending going for food, going for guns, not going there at all? That was the mission I accepted, and my qualification was being dumb enough to undertake it. And uh, what I got was a plane ticket to Lisbon and had to find my own way in. And I, I, you know, I did do that, but, you know, I didn't save any children. I mean, I, I went there with that grandiose motive, but all I did was see, as I said, wholesale child abuse. You know, after I got back, I knocked around, did some things and ended up um, running a group in Chicago that was essentially to service the migrant population from Appalachia. After that, I ran a reentry center for ex-convicts. 
And after that, I ran a maximum security prison for aggressive, violent youth. Where was that? The last place? Yeah. In Massachusetts. Right outside of Boston, a place called Rosendale. It was the state institution for such children. It was only after that that I went to law school. So by then, I went to law school with malice of forethought. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and that was represent children. Since then, my practice is limited to representing children, and I do it in every form you could think of. Children who've had crimes committed upon them, children who have been accused of committing crimes. Children abused and neglected by their parents, children abused by institutions, agencies, organizations, institutions like that. This interview with Andrew Vax, who died on December 27, 2021, was recorded in the KPFA studios on June 27, 1991, with my co-host for Probabilities, Richard A. Lupoff. I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. You mentioned your experience at Rosendale in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that such institutions do anybody any good? I don't think any institution standing alone does anything. Institutions are just structures. I think that the staff, as it eventually evolved there, did some of the kids a world of good. The problem is that they were all mingled together. So we were very successful with the shooters, stabbers, and stompers. We were complete failures with the sex criminals. There's an almost cliche to the effect that so-called reform schools are really nothing but crime schools and that prisons are nothing but the graduate school equivalent thereof. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with this? I agree that they can be. I agree that to a great extent they have been. I don't agree that they must be so. We ran an institution for, quote, the worst kids in the state, unquote. And for some of them, there were significant breakthroughs and changes in behavior. And they went on, because remember, it's been many years, and I can look at them now. Yes. Uh, they went on to, I mean, listen, I'm not saying that they ended up being uh, something as noble as a uh, uh, person that cured cancer or something as odious as a politician. I mean, something sort of in the <laughs> middle. But they're human beings and they're citizens. With others, we, we had no such result. Uh, you use the term human beings, and, and that interests me. If we can get back to your books for a moment, most particularly the current one, Sacrifice, uh, it seemed to me that in the shady, shadowy world where Burke lives, where we have criminals and, and their enemies, I, I won't even say crime fighters, they use the term human being or citizen occasionally to refer to anybody who isn't part of of their peculiar subculture. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's exclusionary language. It's intended to be so. They believe the world is one side or the other side or non-combatants. When Burke says citizen, he means the kind of people that hurt him, the kind right. of people that look the way the others get hurt, not with him. You know, with him, against them, or on the sidelines. Stand up or stand aside. I admit that his world's very black and white. But I'm tired of critics saying, well, geez, there's so many shades of gray. Well, there is for them. But I'm not pretending that what I'm writing is journalism. What I'm writing is a damaged person's point of view of that reality. You have a crusade and a cause. You have the background uh, to explore it in a nonfiction route. Why did you choose fiction? Okay. Very simple. My first book was a work of nonfiction. It was called The Lifestyle. See, you're giving me a very puzzled look. It was called The Lifestyle Violent Juvenile. It got wonderful reviews. It got no sales. Maybe you sold 2,500 copies. It's still on government reading lists if you're going to run a maximum security institution for juveniles. It was essentially these books with footnotes and without the narrative style and without protagonists that could talk directly to you. I am a preacher of sorts. I wanted a much bigger congregation. I'm a working man, so I don't have access to a radio station, a newspaper, a magazine, TV. Books are the only way. So I went to the novels specifically with that purpose. And as far as saying I still don't write nonfiction, uh, if you read Parade Magazine on Father's Day, if you, I write nonfiction articles all the time. But my appetite to do another nonfiction book, it's not there. The audience is huge for these books and minuscule for the nonfiction text. So you feel at this point, at least in America right now, if you want to get your word across, the way to do it is through fiction. Oh, I could write a nonfiction book that would sell really well, except that I'd be violating the confidentiality of my clients. I get an offer a week minimum from TV. Oh, we want to do this show about you. We just need to interview some of your clients. 
They're not going to do that. Not exposing my children to that. I'm not listening to the crap that it will benefit other children because it's not fair to make abused children take that way. Now, they've already been damaged enough. And this idea of exposing them to media scrutiny and then they have to deal with what they said and how they've reacted 10 years later, 15 years later is wrong. It's just morally wrong. So I don't do that. Yeah, I could write nonfiction, but then I'd be talking about sources I couldn't disclose and things that I refuse to document because I'd be violating people's privacy. So this is pretty much what I'm stuck with. There's a reference in your latest book uh, in a courtroom scene to the so-called Rulon case. Is yes. this an actual case? Oh, absolutely. Sir. Would you talk about that? Okay. Uh, essentially, and by the way, that section of the book, yes. again, to distinguish between fantasy, the California lawyer has reprinted that section of the book. So the Rulon case essentially said that a little girl was going to testify at trial. The social worker to calm her down, took the witness stand, put the little girl on her lap, and the girl was allowed to testify from that position. The decision was that you know, this polluted the process of transmitting information and the kid could have been given nonverbal signals and in any way tainted the adversarial process. So it wasn't allowed. This section of my book is to make fun of that because what the little girl is doing is sitting there and patting a seeing eye dog. There's another element in the book. The child who was suffering from multiple personality syndrome, I believe his name was Luke. Yes. Also known as Satan's Child mm -hmm. and, so, and Baby, 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 mm -hmm. Toby. Luke is that book of the Bible which says, if you harm a child, better that there be a millstone on your neck and you be thrown into the deepest sea. Have you ever encountered such a child? Absolutely. And is your feeling then that, are they just monsters? Are they beyond redemption? Is the, are they just evil or, or, or just sick? What Not can you do about like this? That. First of all, you're asking me to talk about a very specific area of psychiatry. Multiple personality disorder, although it has the most florid manifestations that appears to be almost demonic, is one of the most curable disorders imaginable, especially with very young children. What you seek is fusion, the melding of all these split personalities into one. So, evil? That, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Let me explain it to you this way. Let me talk about inescapable shock syndrome. Let's look at this table we've got here. Let's pretend it's an electrified grid. Place a mouse on that grid, okay? Mouse is just walking along. I press a button, the mouse gets a shock. Every place that mouse goes, he gets a shock. Eventually, when I electrify the whole grid, the mouse either sits there and dies or jumps off the table regardless of consequences. That's what a child, suffering as Luke did in this book, does in his mind. And if he's gifted enough, because you have to have quite an intellectual capacity to be a multiple, you develop another personality. So he developed more than one. One personality that was literally anesthetic for pain, to take the pain. Another to take vengeance, to be that kind of strong, impregnable sort of person. Such a person is not at all evil and not at all sick. He's damaged. But if you're asking me if a predatory pedophile is sick, that's different. Because to feel those feelings, I grant you, is sick. But to act on them, which is a volitional choice, that's evil. And do you believe that this, this, uh, as in the battered child syndrome, is passed from generation to generation? No, I do not. And I don't believe the battered child syndrome is passed from generation to generation either. The evidence is overwhelming that many, many, many abused children who grow to be adults not only refuse to imitate their oppressors, but actually go in the other direction and become the, the finest parenting models you can imagine. It's a choice. Cultural patterns are transmitted. If your father raised you with a razor strap, you are likely to do that to someone else. But sexual abuse, for example, is not simply passed from generation to generation. There has to be a volitional choice to do it. But that's, that's the point of this book, is to demythologize. The ancients, our elders, they knew the truth. They just didn't have fancy, euphemistic words like we do. They said vampire, because what is a predatory pedophile? How does he breed? He has to feed on others, and if he feeds successfully, he replicates himself. What's a werewolf? Multiple personality disorder. They didn't have all these fancy words. Unfortunately, they knew more than us, because we get a child molester. We get a freak. We get a stylized sadist, and we say he suffers from pedophilia. Now, you know, I just addressed an organization of psychiatrists, and I said, I know a guy. This guy habitually, continually, obsessively, compulsively 
sticks up 7-Elevens. Now, what is he, suffering from arm robbery? And he refuses to confess. Does that mean he's in denial? I mean, when are you going to stop this stuff? Best case scenario, you're in charge of dealing with the entire issue. What do you do? I'm going to have to speak in epigrams because we don't have the hours that it would take to really go into it. Right. First thing I do is I raise the stakes. Right now, it's too damn cheap a game to hurt children. It is insane. This country is nuts when it talks about a war on drugs and not a war, a war on child molestation. The war on drugs were already lost and we're all POWs. That was baloney from the beginning. But a war on child molestation would reward every American. Today's victim is odds on to become tomorrow's predator. If you're really interested in crime prevention, we put all our money in at the front end. You do not get a John Wayne Gacy, a Ted Bundy, a Charles Manson by biogenetic mutation. You get it by that inescapable shock syndrome I described. You get it by systematic, chronic, ugly child abuse. And the price of not intervening or the price of government knowing and refusing to intervene is the building of a sociopath, which is nothing more than a creature without empathy, a person who feels only his own pain. Now, when such people go ambulatory, there are big successes on Wall Street, okay? It's only when their means of self-gratification is dangerous to human beings in a physical way that we call them monsters. But serial killers, multiple rapists, they are created creatures. So the first thing we do is front end it. And the second thing we do is raise the stakes at the back end. Now that's very broad, but that's exactly what I'd do if I was in charge. And what it would do is satisfy the humanitarian instinct in some of us and in all of us appeal to our self-interest. Every single one of us. In these books, uh, certainly in, in uh, Sacrifice, and as I recall in several of the earlier ones, uh, we have Burke pursuing uh, uh, a child uh, molest molestation case in one mm. form or another, right. coming to the end and building into a giant, uh, pardon the expression, sort of Mickey Spillane-esque apocalypse at the end with heavy fire from weapons and all sorts of being... Um, uh, violence and explosiveness going on. Uh, is this deliberate and, and by calculation on your part? It's difficult for me to answer the question because I disagree with its premise. I know the books. I wrote them. Tell me the ending of Hard Candy. Where's the apocalypse? Where's the explosion? Where's anything? Burke is a person who won't even use an automatic weapon because he's afraid it'll jam. This last book was a departure for a lot of reasons because it's a much more mythical, metaphorical book than the other ones. But you're confusing a straightforward assassination for money with the shootout at the OK Corral. And indeed, the point that's made in this last book, I mean, I, I don't know, it's not a mystery, so why do I care if I give away the ending? What happens with this explosion of violence? Who ends up making the ultimate sacrifice in that book? The child. An innocent child. So what am I really saying? That that's the answer? Of course not. That's the whole point. I have built it up and built it up so when you finally have over six books, this cataclysmic explosion with people flying through the air. Burke entered that house to kill his past. Yes. He didn't enter the house to protect the child. And what he ends up doing is resurrecting him. That's what he got for his violence. People say to you, you know, think Burke is effective as a vigilante. He's not effective as a human being. He is a voice. He's a narrator. But he's not a hero. Were you intending on this sort of apocalyptic ending when you began Flood? No, I never thought that there'd be a second book. I haven't got that kind of ego. I thought it'd be my one shot, which is why Flood is an overwritten, flabby book compared to the others. I wasn't sure I'd get another time in the ring. At the time of his death, Andrew Vax had written a total of 18 Burke novels, culminating in Another Life in 2008, nine additional novels, five collections of short stories, nine more comics and graphic novels, along with three plays. Richard Lupoff and I would interview him once more in 1995 while he was on tour for his novel, Footsteps of the Hawk. This interview with Andrew Vax, who died on December 27, 2021, was recorded in the KPFA studios on June 27, 1991, with my co-host for Probabilities, Richard A. Lupoff. I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. Coming up now, the second interview of today's show. My guest is Charles Yu, whose novel is titled Interior Chinatown, won the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction. There's one earlier novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. There are two short story collections, 
third class superhero and sorry please thank you Charles you also was I guess on the staff writing staff of the first season of Westworld as a story editor co-wrote one episode also wrote episodes of Lodge 49 here and now and a show I've never heard of sorry for your loss also, uh, several articles written for the Atlantic, New York Times Style magazine. Charles, you, I want to go into your whole career, but it seems to me that in reading Interior Chinatown, what you're doing is you're mashing up about 10 different genres, from the polemic to the screenplay to science fiction and fantasy, and possibly autobiography in there, too. Mashing up is fair probably a little more intentional than the reality. You know, I wrote the story as it kind of came to me. Only as it sort of took shape did I realize, oh, it's it's got this and that. This bit does feel, you know, like polemic. This bit does feel obviously structured as a screenplay. And there are some parts that are inspired by autobiographical things, but lightly to moderately fictionalized. And in some cases... It's very fictionalized. Well, obviously, it's very fictionalized since it exists in a world that doesn't exist. But I I was thinking, of course, about the story of the parents of the main character, Willis Wu, in particular, their stories. Does that have uh, a background in the story of your parents? It does. Yeah, that's right. My parents did both immigrate to the U.S. from Taiwan in the 60s. And they did go to the places that those characters went first. My dad landed in Mississippi on an engineering scholarship uh, as a graduate student and uh, was one of only a you know, handful of Asian foreign students at that point on campus. I mean, I imagine I, I tried, I don't have great research skills, but I tried to figure out like how many were on campus when he arrived, but I didn't get very far. But from what he tells me, He knew everyone on campus that was a foreign student. And my mom did end up in Alabama at first. And then from there, you know, I made up stuff. Let's go back a little bit. It's been 10 years since your first novel. You've been writing a lot of short stories. And in the interim, you did work in television uh, on that first season of Westworld, which was a terrific season. But the relationship of your work in television to interior Chinatown. Is that where the origin of creating this kind of teleplay began? I think so. It's weird that it didn't occur to me earlier, but it's probably a good thing because I think if I had the idea just as a concept by itself, it wouldn't have gotten very far. It would just be this sort of conceit that I would have felt, okay, what does this have to do with what I'm trying to do here? The way it actually happened was more... I don't know, organic, I guess is the word. It just happened. You know, I, I, I heard some of the, the opening lines of the book just sort of dropped in my lap. You know, it doesn't happen very often, but I just thought, oh, here's a story. And, and some of those lines started falling out of my head. And, and I, from there, said, oh, if he's an actor, is this a screenplay? And so I kind of worked my way up to it. Even then, I, I was a little afraid. I was like, well, what is this? Is this a gimmick? You know, will people want to look at this or read it? But that's how it occurred to me is about early 2017, I started writing it in this version or maybe spring of 2017. And so at that point, I'd been working in TV for a couple of years. I guess it was a combination of unconsciously just being steeped in screenplays all the time. And then it sort of working its way through my subconscious, I guess. The interior Chinatown is an examination ripping apart the stereotypes of Asian actors in Hollywood. And more recently than, say, the 30s or 40s, this is all kung fu stuff. So we're talking 60s and thereafter. Did you face any of those stereotypes when you were working on any of these TV shows where people said to you, bring in this or that, and you went, aha, stereotype? I think the short answer is no. We've come a long way from the 60s and 70s, but also just probably from 10 years ago. The rooms that I was working in on all those shows, uh, the writers are really thoughtful, talented, and sensitive people. That to some extent, if I had 
personal experience to bring to the story, they would be interested in hearing it. But they didn't pigeonhole me for the most part and look to me to be the sort of mouthpiece or authority on any questions for the most part. I I think there were moments here and there where if there's an Asian American character on screen, there's a feeling of, well, we definitely should make sure that we hear what Charlie has to say, you know, before we decide on a direction. But I think of that more as kind of a deference or desire to be inclusive or to listen than anything else. The place where I think that there's some stereotyping, but maybe it is stereotyping, is is a little more unconscious and it's a little more on the macro level of like, if a character is of Asian descent, specifically East Asian descent, there's sometimes a, a thought that we have to go into that character's backstory in a way that touches on their heritage or their ancestry, you know, or their country of origin that I don't think happens with say characters of European descent to the same extent. You know, I think the idea of like, Oh, this character's from wherever, you know, this country. And maybe it's because the family immigrated more recently in theory in the story. So there could be good reason for that. But I I did find sometimes that there was like a desire to, to bring in an Asian American's, background in a way that, you know, doesn't necessarily match with my personal experience. You know, I was born and raised in LA. My parents are from Taiwan and I was definitely raised with a sense of identity about, you know, my ancestry and heritage. But uh, on a day-to-day level, it's not like I'm walking around thinking about, you know, any of that. And so I don't don't know if that's exactly a stereotype, but I think that's maybe um, an interesting sort of byproduct of having this inclusiveness is that you, people want to talk about my story or stories that would be close to my experience in a way that doesn't always really match my actual experience. Charles Yu, let's talk specifically about Interior Chinatown. It sets forth the story of a guy named Willis Wu who is kind of stuck in this half real, half Hollywood screenplay life dealing with the stereotypes of Asians, in particular Chinese Asians, but of course that expands outward, when you were constructing it or writing it, how did the stereotype, the idea of the Kung Fu man, of the Asian man, the um, dead Asian man, the generic Asian man, the Asiatic seductress, how did all of that come together? I think it was all kind of in a big clump in my head. And so it was a matter of extracting it from my head piece by piece. Because honestly, I think this is baggage that I've carried with me growing up. I'm 45 now as of a couple weeks ago. Uh, So I grew up in the 80s, you know, watching 80s TV and 90s TV and movies. You just never saw Asians on screen ever, East Asians or South Asians. And when you did, it was such a rare occurrence that you were always very excited. And then quickly that excitement would be replaced either with embarrassment uh, because the Asian was going to be sort of a flat, sort of somewhat offensive stereotype or best case scenario, just inconsequential, right? Just someone delivering food or with no lines. It always struck me as like, why is that such a weird occurrence or or why is that such a weird feeling to see an agent on tv and i think you know one of the things that i answered for myself in the book was it's weird because it takes you out of the reality of the show and why does it take you out of the reality of the show because you never see them it's it's like a chicken and egg thing you know meaning until the moment when i saw an asian i wasn't sitting there thinking "Hmm, i never see asians on tv i'm just watching the show but all those years I've, i've been conditioned to watch shows with a version of reality of America where Asians don't exist. And then suddenly you see one, you're like, oh yeah, they do exist. That's the backdrop for sort of this feeling of like, oh, they're, they're very much in the background. And I think these roles, I've had plenty of people write to me, actors or non-actors, saying, man, I can't believe how scarily accurate is, you know, this is. I've actually played that role, you know, called whatever, henchman number five or whatever. And they come from reality. Those are the types that you, you can sort of count on two hands or one hand even. You know, at some point in history, this was like what mostly you saw on TV or film for Asians. And so it was sadly not a lot of research was required for that. 
<laughs> Except for Bruce Lee in Green Hornet. Exactly. You know, when did you become aware of that? Yeah. Green Hornet was a little before my time, so that wasn't until later. But I was aware of Bruce Lee pretty young. I want to say eight or nine. Somehow I must have gotten my hands on VHS cassettes of Enter the Dragon and Fists of Fury. And I think these are rated R movies, probably because of the violence, but there's a little bit of nudity. I, I, so, which makes me wonder if did my parents rent it or was it like a friend's house? That I don't remember, but I remember watching these Bruce Lee movies pretty early on. And that was, yeah, a, a formative moment in terms of seeing somebody who wasn't one of those roles, right? Not delivering food, not, he, I mean, he's the hero and he's not just any hero. He's like the most badass, fierce guy. I mean, everyone liked him. Like, there's no question, you know, kids of any race, there's certain pantheon level people who's like, there's unassailably cool, right? And Bruce Lee is one of those people. And that feels really good for like a group of kids who don't have anyone, you know, no athletes, no politicians or leaders, but we don't have anyone. We don't even have like the, the side character in a cartoon. And then you have like one of the all time cool guys. I think that's why like, Asian kids really latch on to that because it's like, okay, at least we have Bruce Lee. Yeah, I still feel that way. The character of Willis Wu lives in something called the SRO, which is located above a restaurant called the Golden Palace. I had never heard of an SRO. What is that? SRO is a single room occupancy. So it's basically a place where you can rent just a room. You know, and you have a shared bathroom down the hall and a shared kitchen. So I guess it's a little bit like, you know, some dorm rooms. They're common in some Chinatowns, partly because I think they're more affordable than other ways of living. And you wouldn't just have necessarily a, a person, one person living. Sometimes you could have a whole family living in a room that really is not very big. So that's where the characters live in this story. For me, it was, it was working on a couple of levels, working as a literal place. And it was also working as a kind of conceptual place where the the background Asians of this story are, tra are trapped. The use of real life, this fictional place, and the metafictional difference between real life and TV, how conscious were you of trying to blend it in such a way that it all made sense? Yeah, yeah. I struggled with it making sense. Do you mean both as a kind of actual episode of TV or do you mean as a book? More as a book than an actual okay. <laughs> episode of TV. Yeah, yeah. As an episode of TV, it vacillates because characters die, but they don't die. No, you're, you're right. As a TV episode, there was a thought early on, like, oh, it would be cool if this actually, if you just took out the actual bits also played as a real episode. And I kind of gave up on that pretty quick because I thought, one, this is hard enough, what I'm <laughs> trying to do here. And two, I didn't know if I could wrench the story in such a way that would it would fit perfectly to also work as a TV episode. Probably I could have, but I think it would have taken even longer. But as a book, it was like really um, a challenge. And I had a lot of help from my editor and my book agent. They were both reading drafts of this as it came along and we had a lot of discussions about does this make sense the big one was what is the reality of what's going on is this a show is this an actual show like how are we to understand what happens you know when willis walks from one place to another is this like are we on a the warner brothers back lot or or what you know or is this charlie kaufman land is this a and and so they pushed me to really try to articulate what i was driving at here, what, what this is supposed to feel like to the reader. And, and you know, I, I think there are places where the rules get a bit squishy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if that's where sci-fi, you could definitely not call it hard sci-fi. And, and, and uh, in, in terms of, maybe that's not the best analogy, but, you know, people have noticed, like, you, you seem to start out one way, and then now on page 83, the character is doing this, which I didn't think was allowed, and the rules of black and white. And Fair point, you know, and so I guess my answer slash sort of catch all defense to like logic problems is I meant to do that. <laughs> I was trying to have it both ways. I think the ambiguity 
to some extent is intentional. And it's that Willis and the other characters really do live in this kind of amalgam or composite of a physical place and a mental place, as do people. I think that's sort of how we live, right? We walk around in our own reality, which we sort of project onto physical reality. And so, yeah, that's what I was going for. You're listening to an interview with Charles Yu, whose novel is entitled Interior Chinatown, which won the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction. I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. Charles Yu, I think what happened with me was about halfway through the book, I kind of like threw up my hands and said, I'm just going to read the book, which is what you do in a lot of TV shows or films. The only answer to this is to just go with it and don't worry about it. I'm grateful to you for doing that. And that's definitely the, the best outcome for, for me as the writer, that someone is willing to, is generous enough and, and willing to go along and hopefully get something out of that. Do you think that having worked on a time travel novel where paradoxes overwhelm whatever you think of time travel might have helped you in working this as well as the paradoxes involved in working on Westworld? As to the first part about time travel, that's really interesting. I don't think anyone's actually ever brought up that specific point, but I think there's something to that for sure. I think having played in that space, which has all of these constraints, of course, and I don't think I did a similar thing, but I think there was a kind of analogous approach there too. I am not going to try to define overly rigorous rules about time travel here because what I'm really interested in is the story, you know, and the characters. That said, I would like to have enough internal consistency, even if that's very, very kind of fuzzy kind of, you know, consistency, that at least you could step back and say, well, I guess I see what the rules are, even if the rules are a little squiggly. So I think that, yeah, ultimately I had to be comfortable with not nailing down every single logic point and having a more kind of general scheme to it. And I think the West world of it helped in that TV is obviously very much more collaborative than fiction writing. And that helped me because I kind of had to assemble a little bit of like a writer's room in my own head. You know, I had to get used to the idea of competing voices and shooting down my own ideas and imagining an internal showrunner who's like going to, you know, knock down my pitches or co-writers in the room who are going to poke holes in my logic. That helps. And I think another thing that helped is watching you know, the showrunners on Westworld are so meticulous about the way they constructed that, you know, at least the first season that I worked on. And we talked through everything for hours, endlessly, you know, weeks and months. And having that kind of patience to get it right, uh, I don't know that, I'm not saying I'm sort of capable of that kind of endurance, but actually going through a process that was that painstaking, you know, is good training for like trying to do your own work because, you know, it it, uh, it just reminded me and also taught me a lot of things about like, how do these other writers approach story? How do they work? How do they critique their own work? Yeah, both of those things were, were really helpful, I think. Charles Yu, let's go back into your career. You began as a lawyer and a poet and wound up writing short fiction. What happened? Yeah, I wrote poems in college as an undergrad, and that was my minor, actually. And then I just stopped. I stopped writing poems after I graduated. I don't know what it was, but maybe it was just like something that felt like I wanted to do during under the safe umbrella of college. And that once I was in the real world, I thought, I don't know, but I, I never wrote, I never wrote a poem after I graduated. But I think in retrospect, what I realized is that I wanted to write short fiction, but I was, I was just like, breaking up the lines in my in my stories and writing very short stories that I just would randomly hit the enter key. And so I, I think all along I was trying to write fiction. And right when I graduated from law school is really when I started to write stories. I, I think what I was looking for was a kind of creative outlet because I was working on these hours as a lawyer. And so I just scribbled these little things in the margins of notepads or I'd send myself little emails, you know, with a line or something that just kind of interested me and they eventually started turning into these weird experimental little short stories. Had you had a background reading science fiction? Some. I'd read some Asimov and Bradbury and uh, some fantasy, like I read some Piers Anthony and uh, I played D&D, you know, read comics, 
I don't, I don't know that I was like heavy, heavy into science fiction. I think a guy I read in college or a writer I read in college was Richard Powers. I read some Jonathan Latham. I think they kind of opened my eyes to this kind of use of science fiction or science fiction tropes, even in narratives that you maybe didn't necessarily think of as science fiction. I'd, I'd read some of that in college as well. How did you get involved in writing for television? It was you know, somewhat accidental, but it, it was a slow, gradual process of meeting people. So basically, after my first novel was published, you know, I was working as a lawyer, but I had a little bit of interest in film or TV adaptation of that book. So I started working with, in addition to my publishing agent, got like a TV film rights agent. And so they started to send me on meetings at first, you know, specifically around this book, but slowly I'd meet enough people or people would become interested in other things I'd written. And so I'd go on kind of more general meetings with executives or the kinds of people who could hire you to write things. And so I did that for, you know, three, four years, just thinking, well, these are great. It's fun, you know, fun to take a couple hours away from the office if I can sneak off and go meet somebody. And it's like a couple times a year, really. But I eventually met an executive at HBO who somehow got my name in the mix for the Westworld job. So that's really how it happened is, you know, I was at work one day and my agent called and like, would you want to go for a meeting to try to get a job on this writing staff? And I thought, uh, yes. <laughs> but also, you know, like, what are the odds? I just thought, this is crazy, but why not? And that led to all the other work. Have you written screenplays yourself? I am working, yeah, on a few projects now that are for development. Nothing, you know, officially has been like picked up to series, but Interior Chinatown is being developed with Hulu. So I'm writing a pilot based on the book to hopefully be a show for them. And a couple of other similar projects where I think I'm not allowed to talk about it, electrocute my hair or something. But uh, yeah, but yeah, so that that's that's only in the last couple of years. After I think having worked in writers' rooms for a while people will sort of take a chance and say, well, you know, you've learned enough. Like, can you try to do this for your own project? How has the pandemic affected your career that way? I mean, it's changed it. I definitely do a lot less driving because I used to have to drive to LA for all these meetings and now I get to just Zoom with people. So that's nice. You know, I miss aspects. I miss people, obviously. But sometimes you like, you know, go into a fancy office and you get a bottle of water but other times you get to like actually go have a meal with someone and it's, it's sort of fun. You get to know someone like a executive or a producer or something. But for the most part, it just means like I get to sit in my house and read and write and see my family more. So I love that I'm actually both more productive and at home more luckily or maybe unluckily for me. But all of my projects are not yet at the point where they're like in production. You know, I'm still very much just in the writing phase. So Last year, I had the good luck of just writing a lot. I you know, it, as, as this thing drags on into this year, I don't know if that will change. But for now, it's mostly just given me more writing time. Uh, are you working on another novel? I'm like, yeah, lightly tiptoeing around ideas. But if I even think that I am, then I know I'll either get writer's block or I'll jinx it. <laughs> so uh, I'm like kicking around ideas. One thing I noticed in reading Interior Chinatown is... Um, over the years, I've had discussions whenever I've interviewed him with a writer named David Shields, who spends a lot of time talking about metafiction and new ways to write. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, a little bit, yes. He edited an anthology that I had a story in, I, I think. The reason I mention this is because you are part of what seems to be obviously, you're not thinking in those terms, a kind of movement away from straight-on narrative fiction, uh, what he calls big bloated novels. So I guess my question to you is, is that what you read as well? Is that where your interest lies or it just happens to be what you're writing? I mean, I, I certainly love to dive into a big novel, but I do think, yeah, my reading tends toward the more eclectic or things that are playing with form or aren't that kind of 400 page third person straight ahead narrative, whatever that means. You know, I don't mean to make it sound like there's a whole class of books that are all homogenous in that sense, but I tend to look for things and I'm like, Oh, 
what is this trying to do with structure or what is this trying to do with point of view or genre, you know? Charles, you, we've been stuck in this pandemic universe for a year. Even with the vaccine, we have no idea when we'll get out of it. You said in a uh, article in The Atlantic, what is normal life anyway? What kinds of TV shows do you watch that you would recommend as someone who's been working on shows like Westworld or writing books like Interior Chinatown? My wife and I have found ourselves, probably like other people, faced with 500 choices and then going towards none of them. We'll just either leave the news on or you know look for a documentary because for whatever reason, diving into a narrative in the last few months has been harder. One thing I watched last year that I really enjoyed was The Great on Hulu. Uh, I loved its tone. I thought it was smart and funny and just unexpected in so many ways. I think that's a really cool thing that is possible on TV and probably no other medium, you know. Sort of the serial nature of it and the incongruity between the visuals and the tone and the, you know, historical backdrop with modern sensibility and humor. I think that was a just a cool unexpected find for me. Novel versus short story. Which you like writing more? Can I say neither? They're equally difficult. I guess I like finishing things. So I have finished more stories, short stories in my life than I have novels. I like starting novels. If I could only pick one to write from here on out, it would be short stories. Because you can finish them. Yeah, I'm more likely to actually produce them. Whereas there's no guarantee I'll ever finish. I mean, this, this last one took almost seven years and it's pretty short. But then also you've got your television and screen work. If Interior Chinatown did become a uh, TV series, would you be the showrunner? I would like to be. I think that would be the plan if, you know, things move forward. I'd also be happy to work with someone else. If someone else had a vision and I, I could just write, someone else wanted to showrun it, maybe I'd learn from them. And you'd be on the writing staff? Yeah, in theory. But I think as of right now, the, the idea is that I'm supposed to write this and, you know, who knows what they'll do. One configuration that I've seen that I think is fairly common is if someone like me creates a show but has not show run something, they can pair me with someone who has done it. So there's kind of a team. And so that would be cool. That, that was actually, I think, what happened on Lodge 49 is Jim Gavin, this you know fiction writer who created this really great show, uh, hadn't run a show. So they paired him with um, Peter Ocko and they made this really special show. Getting to see the way that dynamic worked, I think that was really cool. You've been listening to an interview with Charles Yu, whose novel Interior Chinatown won the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction. Until next week, I'm Richard Walensky on the Bookwaves Artwaves Hour. Greetings, friends. This is Bob Baldock, KPFA's producer of author events for the past 30 years. KPFA is about to present a Zoom event concerning my own just-published memoir about my participation in the Cuban Revolution with Fidel Castro's 26th of July movement. Written as a novel, the memoir is titled Wild Green Oranges. I'll be interviewed on January 27th at 7 p.m. by Kevin Hunziker, KPFA's development director. We'll discuss the many months some years ago when I was the only U.S. citizen who served as a combatant with Fidel's group in the Sierra Maestra. This will be the last event Ken Preston and I produce for the station, but events will continue. Warm thanks for supporting us over the years. Our final Zoom event about my own book is January 27th, 7 p.m. I'm Kevin H., KPFA's new development director. I've been a longtime fan of the station's programming and mission that speaks truth to power and protects the health, wealth, and welfare of our listeners. I'm here to help all donors, especially our monthly sustainers. Also, to streamline the donation process for legacy gifts, stock donations, and employer matching. Please help us stay as vigilant as always and become a member today at kpfa.org. Thank you. Listening to 94.1 KPFA, 
89.3 KPFB in Berkeley. KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno. 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz. And online worldwide. Worldwide. Worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.